Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Vantage seminar in February. And we're continuing with the topic of curves and abelian varieties over finite fields. Today, I'm very happy to say that we have Jeff Actor as the speaker, and he's going to be talking about equidistribution counts abelian varieties. And if you have questions during the talk, feel free to ask them uh, just at, at any time. Wonderful. So Jeff, is it all right for us to video this talk? Sounds fine. Sounds good. Great. All right, go ahead. All right. Um, thanks, uh, Rachel and Drew, for running this seminar um, so steadfastly for the past couple of years. I'm very much honored to uh, participate on this side of things now. So as Rachel said, and I'll be talking <clears throat> about a a way of counting abelian varieties over finite fields. And if questions arise during the talk, I'd be really happy to entertain them as best I can in real time. So um, the basic question that I'm after today is, how big is an isogeny class of elliptic curves over a finite field? And um, what I'll be reporting on for the most part is work with, uh, I started talking with Julia Gordon about this a while ago, and we were soon joined by Ali Altug and uh, Louis Garcia. And here's how the story goes. <clears throat> so as a quick reminder, sometimes you have not one but two elliptic curves over a field and you call them isogenous if there is a non-trivial map between them. And if you happen to be, if your life is over a finite field, then it turns out that you can detect isogeny just by counting points on the two elliptic curves. And in fact, it's equivalent, of course, to um, since the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius knows everything about the number of points on the elliptic curve. Um, so the, this Frobenius polynomial always has the form t squared minus the trace of Frobenius plus q, where this q is that q. And then two elliptic curves have this are isogenous exactly if this number a is the same. So I can specify an isogeny class by saying, all right, this is my field and this is my trace of Frobenius. And the isogeny class is all the elliptic curves with this trace of Frobenius and not some other. And so the question I'm after is, what is the size of this set? Or we could count like professionals and weight everything with one over the size of the automorphism group. And I just want to kind of ease into this uh, set of questions, even though I realize that a lot of you can um, already anticipate what kind of, you know, how the answers might look, but it's nice to uh, kind of reconnect with an naive view of it. So here's the first thing that I tried when I was wondering about this. Well, I know that there, the trace of Frobenius is a number between minus two root Q and two root Q. And I know there are about Q elliptic curves over FQ. And what's nice about this statement is that either you count and say, well, there are QJ invariants, so there are Q elliptic curves. And then someone says, oh, but what about twists? But in terms of if you compensate for that by um, waiting by automorphism, you get the same answer anyway. But anyways, if you, um, you know, your first guess then might be that sort of account for these two facts is that these numbers are uniformly distributed, meaning that if you just take a whole bunch of elliptic curves and start tabulating their traces, maybe they will be uniformly distributed there on the, um, in this interval. And so then the heuristic that you would guess is that the number of elements in this isogeny class, maybe weighted by automorphism, is you know, something like, well, you have Q elliptic curves and you divide them into on the order of root Q, different bins. So maybe the answer is about root Q. But then you remember all these gorgeous pictures that Drew has shared with the community over the years, and you realize that that's not right. The distribution is is striking, and uh, but it's not uniform. So the, all you need to know, observe right now, is that this distribution is not uniform. So far, so good. Plus iron, we proceed. All right. So Christelle told us a lot about Frobenius angles um, last week, and I just want to sort of sing out one very small piece of the story, which is that. So it's known that the, um, the roots of this polynomial, they have size root Q, and so they have, so as complex numbers, they look like root Q e to the i theta, and um, 
there are too many minus signs here. But other than that, we're okay. Uh, so um, that will be fixed in a future edition of these slides. But the point is there's an angle that basically knows everything there is to know about this, this isogeny class. And you can reconstruct the trace of Frobenius from this and or its normalized version. And so there's the Sato Tate distribution on the set of possible angles where you say the odd, uh, you know, and it's given by this formula. And on the space of normalized traces, this so what this distribution says is that the odds of a trace being between A and B should be counted by this integral. And anticipating what's going to happen later, I want to just remind you that where this comes from is there is a Haar measure on SU2. And then if you take the trace or half the trace, you get down to the space essentially of conjugacy classes or characteristic polynomials. In SU2, you've already fixed the determinant. And so the Sato Tate measure with that, you know, that semicircle distribution is what happens when you take Haar measure up here on SU2 and push it down to trace land. And uh, there are all sorts of places you can read about this right now. One of the best places is in Drew's notes from the Arizona Winter School a few years ago. All right, so now I have my new improved heuristic and it goes like this. So if I want to count how many things have this trace of Frobenius, I should say, oh, I have all the elliptic curves. And then for each one, I flip a two root Q sided coin and say, what are the probabilities that the trace of this elliptic curve is A? And then I say, oh, well, I have this distribution that looks like this. And so it's height that my favorite trace of Frobenius is this. And then the width of that bar is one over two root Q. And so I'm left thinking that the answer ought to be root Q times one over two pi times the square root of one minus A squared. And um, this seems like I'm throwing more stuff at it. So that seems like it might be closer to the truth, but it's, it's kind of too good to be true. You shouldn't actually hope that a kind of crude estimate like this um, has a chance of being exactly right on the nose. So let's add some more um, ingredients here. So again, you still are fortunate enough to have an elliptic curve over FQ. And for every L, which isn't P, P being the characteristic of FQ, sorry, I have the action of Frobenius on the L torsion, say. And so from this, I can, you know, so if I identify EL with two copies of Z mod L, then I get a Frobenius element in GL2 of Z mod L. And if instead of working mod L, I work with all the L power torsion at once, or rather the inverse limit of it, I have an automorphism of the tape module. And so I get a two by two matrix with coefficients in ZL. And if I'm willing to take conjugacy classes, then that survives the choice I made of this isomorph of this identification. And so I have these Frobenius elements in GL2 of Z mod L or in GL2 of ZL. And with no quantifiers, I just have this vague idea that Frobenius elements are equidistributed in this group, or as equidistributed as they could be. And they are independent, um, and they are also independent. So what happens mod three has nothing to do with what happens mod five. This is always sort of miraculous to me because you have to remember that what happens in the three addicts is completely determined by what happens in the five addicts. But if you're working mod three and mod five, they're different. So if you willfully miss, you know, interpret equidistribution, you might try to do the following. So you define this local factor. And this is a lot to unpack, but it says, you know, for a given, you fix A and Q that you're after, and you look at, you know, some number L. And for bigger and bigger L, what you do is you compute the number of gamma, so just the characteristic polynomial of this gamma is the same as the characteristic polynomial Of your of some elliptic curve in this isogeny class, mod L to the n. So that's what this numerator is. 
so this account like this. And the denominator says, all right, well, how many should go, if, if the elements of GL2 were uniformly distributed among conjugacy classes, how much would each one have? How many elements would each one have? And so this number is a little bigger than one if it's easier to have this characteristic polynomial model. And it's a little smaller than one if it's harder to have this characteristic polynomial model. And so, and by the way, just a way to tie this back to Sado Tate land, this measure is what you would get if on the space of characteristic polynomials, so there's the trace, which can be anything it wants to be, and there's the determinant, which could be anything it wants to be that isn't zero, or then, or sorry, that is invertible. You can push forward Haar measure here to characteristic polynomial space. And so what we've done here is this measure is the push forward of, of uh, natural Haar measure from here to here. And so then you can just kind of pray that maybe this works out anyway. And so your prayers take the following concrete form. You say, all right, I think the number of things that I saw in a class is, well, root Q, because I still kind of believe that I have Q elliptic curves divided among root Q different isogeny classes. And there's a Sato Tate term, because I went to Drew's lectures at the Arizona Winter School, or I read Birch's paper from the late 60s about um, the Sato Tate measure and distribution of elliptic curves or finite fields. And then for every L, I will try to put in a correction of this form because I believe in a Chebotara theorem that's so strong it's false. <clears throat> and this, of course, can't be right because Ecuador, it's unreasonable to ask for you know, the traces of Frobenius of, an, of elliptic curves over F3 to be equidistributed mod 1003 or something like that. There just aren't enough elliptic curves for that to happen. So this can't possibly be right. Which is what makes, I think, Geckler's theorem really striking. He does exactly this. It's from a 2003 IMRN paper. And he says, all right, at L, do what we just talked about a couple of slides ago. And at P, he'll do something similar, except that he knows, and we know, that the um, determinant of the Frobenius element is, is Q. And so if you're trying to work in GL2 of Z mod P, you're out of luck because you have a non-invertible element. And so he fakes it in the numerator by looking for just two by two matrices, which have the right characteristic polynomial. And he still divides out by the size of GL2 of Z mod P to the N like that. And he has the same uh, term at infinity. And then what he proves is that if A actually shows up as a trace of Frobenius for elliptic curves over FP, and here I mean P not Q, and if the isogeny class is ordinary, then the size of the isogeny class is exactly as advertised. This is a really magical theorem. And like a lot of magic tricks, it's actually not as fun when somebody tells you what the secret is. I'm going to sort of tell you. Well, so I don't actually philosophically have an opinion on why it works, but I can tell you how it works as follows. And so what I'm going to do is quickly go through the kind of calculation that shows up. And it's too fast for any, well, say for me to follow all details. But we'll give you some sense of what goes into it. And it's kind of, it's a, it's a very, there's a very soothing matrix calculation that I enjoy doing. So I do it, I, wind, I find myself doing it like every other week or something. All right, sorry. So here is the deal. There's a lot of notation. I'm going to guide you through it as best I can. So Delta is the discriminant of the polynomial. And so if I mod out, take Z of T mod the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, then I get you know, some quadratic order. So it's that K be this quadratic imaginary field. And delta naught is the um, fundamental discriminant of this, is the discriminant of this field. And chi is the quadratic character of this. So this is all this data, which you can read off easily from the Frobenius polynomial. 
And so then delta is some conductor times this fundamental discriminant. And then During tells us that if you want to count the size of the isogeny class, you should start um, enumerating all the orders which contain the Frobenius order and compute their um, class number. If you do this correctly, look at the size of the isogeny. And um, this is like the first kind of primitive instance of the kind of thing that uh, Stefano was drawing out um, in glorious detail a couple of weeks ago for in, in a much more difficult situation where the orders involved have, are more complicated algebraically. But this is an easy enough case that even I can kind of get my head around it. All right, so let's suppose that we're in this good situation um, just to make my life a little bit easier right now. So suppose the Frobenius order is, is maximal. Then you say, all right, well, the size of the isogeny class I'm after is a class number. And I have the analytic class number formula. I should say that I personally, as a human being, don't understand it very well, but I know what it does is it says that you can compute this in terms of an L factor associated to this quadratic character. And so this is kind of standard stuff. And then to compute this, you're taking the product over all L of one over one minus chi of L over L. Meanwhile, back in Geckler land, here's how the matrices work out. So at a good prime, meaning it doesn't divide the discriminant, F of T, um, either splits or it doesn't. And so the centralizer of some element with this characteristic polynomial either looks like a split torus or a non-split torus. In the case of a split torus, it's isomorphic to GM cross GM. And so the group of points on it looks like Z mod L cross or two copies of that. Whereas in the irreducible case, it's the group of units in the quadratic extension of L. And then you write down the count, and that's L minus one squared or L squared minus one, depending on which case you are. And then you go back to the thing that Geckler told us to evaluate. And so the size of the conjugacy class, right, is the number of elements in GL2 mod the size of the torus. And the denominator is this, and this is kind of close to the size of the torus, but it isn't actually the size of either torus. So these guys cancel. And I'm left with this. And then when the dust settles, this is either one, this is one over one plus or minus one over L, depending on whether it's split or irreducible. And so when Geckler writes down his ratios, he's kind of secretly computing these Euler products. And I should say that I am um, right, I'm attributing all sorts of motives and backstory to the way Geckler thought about it. And I and I could very well be wrong about this. So um so don't misattribute my sloppiness to him, if I guess what I'm saying. And if you're inclined to, you can kind of do this to some extent higher, better, faster, more. So um, Cassie Williams did this for certain ordinary abelian surfaces and uh, Rauch, sorry, I've forgotten his first name also work this out for a class of abelian surfaces. And um, Cassie had an undergraduate, um, Gerhard, who worked with her to a generalize her strategy to abelian, certain abelian varieties of prime dimension. And the point that drives this, and this is a fact I learned from Everett Howe a very long time ago, um, is that ratios of class numbers kind of tend to drive these isogeny, sizes of these isogeny classes for higher dimensional abelian varieties. So it's not um, the class number of the CM field itself, but the ratio of it, that of its maximal totally real subfield. And that's the kind of thing that shows up. And I'm gonna leave it there. Oh, thanks for finding him, Drew. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So there are at least two questions this race, but maybe you all in the audience have other questions. So I could take a, a quick break for questions about the background before we go on. Or not, I guess we're going through these questions then. 
So um, it'd be nice to prove Geckler's theorem without actually computing matrices, although in a perverse way, I actually kind of find two by two matrix calculations soothing and fun. Not everybody has that. And uh, Kat said, um, you know, basically, is there a better, you know, is there a better way to do this? Can you tease this out of something faster? Out of um, a different method that doesn't require you to calculate matrices. And happily, the answer is yes. And so what I'm going to spend so the next little while telling you about is a, a generalization of Geckler's formula um, and some of what goes into it. And so the statement is this. Suppose you have a principally polarized abelian variety over FQ with commutative endomorphism ring. And I need X to be ordinary or to be working over the prime field then the size of the isogeny class is as follows. So it's this mess, and I want to kind of give you a, a taste of what each of these terms means. So at L, I'm going to define a term, and the actual definition is kind of horrible, but for most L, it says, how likely is this conjugacy class mod L compared to an average one? There's an Archimedean Sato Tate term, which has this group theoretic description here in terms of the vial discriminant. But when you um, work out what it is, it, you can express it in terms of Frobenius angles and probably should. So I just hit the wrong button here. There is a, and the main term out here is Q to the dimension of the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties, or its square root rather. And so the main size is about q to the g times g plus one over four, which when g is one gives you root q. And this is compatible with the kind of silly guess. If you, if you took my flat guess from the first case, from the first slide and uh, used um, this fact that Everett and Steve DePippo proved back in the nineties that there are about this many isogeny classes, the naive guess is that, remember all the abelian varieties should be uniformly distributed among these things. And so this order of growth is kind of what you would have guessed before you started, if you were going to make a guess. Oh, and there's this Tamagawa number, which um, is an arithmetic invariant of a certain torus, which is going to show up. And at first I thought it was always one, just because in the case when G equals one, it's always one, but it turns out to be much more interesting than that. And the proof is closer anyway to a pure thought um, proof in that we're never actually going to compute matrices and uh, we don't need to use the analytic class number formula as a black box either. Um, there is a way of an equivalent way of reformulating it, which may be more um, tolerable, we'll see. So, the discriminant you can replace by with a polynomial discriminant, essentially. So it's the ratio of the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius to the minimal polynomial of um, Frobenius plus Verschiebung. Um, if K, so the endomorphism ring is now a product of CM fields. So you can compute most of this as a limit of zeta functions at one. And the denominator is from the maximal totally real subalgebra. And then B has all the good stuff. And somehow all, this is an inclusion exclusion thing, which is um, designed to actually account for all the orders between the Frobenius order and the maximal order. And so this formula knows about class numbers. It kind of has to, but you don't actually use the class numbers itself as a, as a tool. It's an emergent phenomenon. <clears throat> And in the absence of serious objections, I want to tell you a little bit about what goes into this. And I feel like I kind of have to say a little bit about it because if I'm advertising that the main improvement over Geckler is we don't compute matrices, I have to show you what we do compute instead. Some of these slides have too much text, but let me walk you through it. Okay. So, 
If you have a G-dimensional principally polarized abelian variety, then Frobenius acts on its tape module and on the QL version of that. And remember, this is something that looks like you know, ZL to the 2G. And the version of Tate's theorem, not for elliptic but for abelian varieties, says that the isogeny class as an unpolarized beast is determined completely by the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius, which lies in the integers, because you can also compute it intrinsic to the endomorphism and not in terms of allotic anything. Now, the polarization, its first turn class gives you a um, skew symmetric pairing on the Tate modules. I guess here this should intrinsically be twisted, but that doesn't matter here. Anyways, the point is that the linear algebraic data now determined by not just X, but by X and Lambda is there's a Frobenius element, which lives not only in GL2G of QL, but it um, transforms nicely with respect to this pairing, or maybe the pairing transforms nicely with respect to it. The effect of which is that gamma naught now lies in the group of symplectic similitudes. And delta naught captures what's happening at Frobenius, oh, sorry, with the Frobenius at P. And they're the right thing to do, or a right thing to do, is look at the crystalline cohomology, which lives over the, um, the suitable unramified extension of QP instead of over QP itself. And again, this is defined up to conjugacy. The elliptic Frobenius is defined up to conjugacy. And the P Frobenius is defined up to sigma conjugacy. And so what happens is if you and I pick different coordinates, then um, your, co your um, element in mine will be related by a twist like this. Where And so that's what this sigma conjugacy means. And of course, if G is one, then lambda is unique. There aren't that many ways to put a Q-symmetric pairing on a two-dimensional vector space, which means the GSP2 is GL2. You don't have to horse around with symplectic similitudes at all. And conjugacy is defined by the characteristic polynomial. And GLN is like the only group that that happens for. So there's a, a bit of luck that happens for us as humans doing linear algebra that we stumbled on GLN before the other things, because life is much easier. All right. So there are a couple of linear algebraic groups I can attach to this thing. So one is capital G is now going to be the group of symplectic similitudes. And so I've got gamma naught. I'm going to think of it as being an adelic point of this group, meaning it's just acting on all the l tape models at once. And delta naught lives in the uh, QQ points of this group. So the polarization induces an involution on the endomorphism ring, at least after you tensor with Q. And you can use this to define a group scheme either as the centralizer of gamma naught or in terms of endomorphisms, it's the set of endomorphisms so that um, if you look at the Q points of this, these are the endomorphisms. So if you look at blah times blah dagger, you get an element of Q and not some other part of the endomorphism. So T turns out to be, with the hypotheses that I've set up, a maximal torus inside GSP. And um, I apologize, there's about to be even more notation building up on it. And it is, this would be too much for me to understand, but my hope is that it will give you a sense of what's happening. And then if you're curious, you can either ask me about the details or read the paper itself. But I think there's some value in going through this. I hope there's some value. We'll see. Anyways, there's this beautiful um, formula of Kotwitz, who says, if you want to compute the size of an isogeny class, here's how you do it. And I should say that um, like, this isn't the theorem that makes Kotwitz Kotwitz. This is just kind of a, a stepping stone for him or a near immediate tool. There's something he proves for all PEL varieties, and it's based heavily on work of Langland from the late 70s and early 80s on how to do this for elliptic curves. Anyways, so he says we should compute this isogeny class uh, by 
integrating the characteristic function of the prime to p integral points. Uh, you take gamma naught and you start conjugating it and say, sometimes do you, you wind up with something which is integral? And those are the ones you count. And you do something similar but worse at p, where you are looking at the twisted conjugacy class of delta naught. And, um, and I should say, this is happening with respect to a certain measure that I'll um, tell you a little bit about in a bit. Oh, okay. right now, in fact. So these canonical measures are measures on the group which give mass one to the um, allotic integral points. And there's this global term, which deals with some overcounting. But in spite of how um, intimidating this may look, if this isn't what you do daily, the proof is actually really elementary. You say, all right, if I have an abelian variety and you have one of those isogeny from mine to yours, then you can express this in terms of some element of the symplectic group. And then you wanna make sure that you preserve integrality. And that's what this is about. But there might be many different isogenies which take my abelian variety to yours. And that's accounted for by here. I apologize for making this whole thing personal, but this is like a very abstract statement that you can make. And it's just, if you meditate on lattices for a while, this is what you get. It's actually much easier than something like say the class number formula, just to pick a black box at random. And so the secret then is I want natural local factors which compute, which secretly compute the integrals like this that show up in the in the Cutlet form. And they, they can't be super naive though, because um, I can't just use a characteristic polynomial of Frobenius because since GSP isn't GLN, um, conjugacy and stable conjugacy are different. The other thing that happens is I can't just use conjugacy in G of ZL because it turns out you can have two integral matrices that are conjugate with QL coefficients, but they aren't conjugate with, with ZL coefficients. And once you decide to, you're gonna go look for things like that, examples are everywhere. And so in a little while, I'm gonna put down this kind of horrible looking local factor, but the reason it has to be what it is is it has to account for things like this. Here we go. So this is the local factor. So we take a limit over D and then over N. So this is something like a conjugacy class that says, show me all the things in G of Z mod L to the N that are conjugate, that are almost conjugate to my gamma naught, where almost conjugate means that I'm allowed to kind of conjugate by matrices that actually have some denominator in them, or that are only invertible after I, um, invert some power of L. They have to do that with some kind of control. And then what happens down here is that, so this is kind of what you would expect. And this is what the professionals call the steinberg hitchin base, but since I'm not one, I just think of it as the space of characteristic polynomials. And the first thing you prove is that for all but finitely many L, what this is, is it's the number of things in G of Z mod L, which are conjugate to mine, divided by the average among different characteristic polynomials. And so once you've decided to do this, then there's not too much mystery about what has to happen. It's just a big exercise. So help us all in measure theory. Here's how it goes. There are lots of ways to count on sets. And so we're just gonna keep track of how to get back and forth between them. So there is the Sarah Osterle measure on any allatic analytic set. And so what it is, is it is, after the fact the definition is here, but what I will tell you is that if Z is smooth, then this definition plus Hensel's lemma says that the Sarah Osterle measure is basically a counting measure. So it's the number of elements in this thing mod L divided by L to the dimension. That's pretty concrete, or at least in principle. 
there is um, a sort of gauge measure if you have an algebraic group. So if you ever have a top degree you know, differential form, you can integrate it over subsets. And on a group, you can find, look for a G invariant non-vanishing top degree form, top degree form. And then you use that to um, measure set. So the measure of a set is what happens when you integrate the size of this form along this set. In the case of a split algebraic group, then Gross has told us a, you know, a favorite invariant form to use. And it turns out that this canonical form actually computes Sarostole measure. After the fact, you could use that to kind of say, oh, this was a good choice of form. So integrating this differential form counts points. There's yet another way to put a measure on a group. So, you know, they taught us that we could put harm measures on locally compact groups. And the only ambiguity is in the scaling. And so you choose your favorite set, you declare it has size one, and you walk away. It turns out that your favorite subset is the ZL points once you've chosen a good model. And so that's the canonical measure. And finally, there's the geometric measure. And it works like this. You've got the space of characteristic polynomials down here, and you've got your group up here. And this kind of behaves like a vibration. So if you look near your favorite point, there are directions which correspond to um, varying the characteristic polynomial, and there are directions which correspond to staying in the same orbit or the same conjugacy class. And you can use that to factor your favorite form as a differential form coming from the base and this other part. And this other part is a differential form that's just defined on this orbit. And so then if somebody gives you a subset over here, you can integrate this form over that set and that's a way of defining a measure on the orbit. And then there's the Tamagawa number, or Tamagawa measure, sorry. So if you have a torus over a global field like Q and a global form, then um, Tamagawa taught us that we should tweak it with these convergent factors to get an even better form on the torus. And then we can use this to define what we've called the Tamagawa measure on the orbit of gamma naught itself, which is the quotient of the canonical measure on the group by the Tamagawa measure on the torus. And what's left over is some kind of measure on the on the orbit. All right. And so this is how we get things off the ground. So we had this kind of horrible definition for what new L ought to be. And term by term, here's what it's actually doing. So when we let n go to infinity, we are um, taking a, um, we want things mod L to the N where N is ever larger, which are close to gamma naught or whose characteristic polynomials are close to gamma naught. And so what we're doing in, when we're computing something like this is we're actually looking at the ratio of the measure of some elatic neighborhood of the characteristic polynomial to the measure of some elatic neighborhood of the orbit itself. And so as n gets, goes to infinity, this gets closer into here. And what's left over is just the ratio of, um, you know, is what happens when you, um, when this part disappears, and you're just left with the measure on the orbit. So once you decide to do this, it's not hard to relate new L to this geometric measure, which was the one that we got by factoring a gauge form on the group into the, uh, the wedge product of something from downstairs and something from the orbit. And then it's not so bad. So the, um, Local ratios now, with the previous slide, you can use that a little bit more to move 
precisely from this product of these local ratios to this orbit with respect to the um, geometric. And then um, Frankel, Langley, Zingo um, did something like this for um, split semi-simple groups. And we could kind of tweak their work to um, figure out half ends with reductive groups and for groups which are not which are um, quasi-split but not necessarily split. And then with the Kalpas formula, we can move on, we can um, move from this to here. And that more or less is the proof. So, so we had this formula, but we were um, slightly anxious about it because we didn't know how to compute any examples. And so I think I wrote to Christelle, who in turn um, put me in touch with the whole team she was working with, um, including certainly Stefano, probably Valentine, and I know um, David Rowe was part of it too. Forgive me for forgetting the um, full list of emails. And I just asked them for some data. And so one example we came up with was the following. So consider this Ve polynomial. It turns out the isogeny class is ordinary since the um, coefficient here has three attic valuation zero. And it turns out that if you take Q of T mod F of T, you get a Galois extension. And Galois group is um, Z mod four cross Z mod two. And then after the fact, I asked Thomas Rood what the Tamagawa number was of this torus. He at the time was um, building up this machinery for computing these things. It's sort of everybody knew that in principle, these things could be computed. And um, in practice, we knew that for restrictions of scalar tori, the answer was one. And um, Takashi Ono in the early 60s had written down an example where the Tamagawa number wasn't one and in fact was a rational number. And after that, it was kind of anybody's guess. So it turns, uh, but, um, but Thomas told me that the Tamagawa number was two and I had no reason to doubt. Um, so the discriminant of F is actually as close as possible as it could be to being the discriminant of the field, given that it is attached to a Bay polynomial. And so for all finite L, including the L equals P, ah, by the way, so I should say that in the, one thing that got elided in the past several slides is the um, work that goes in moving a character, uh, twisted orbital integral over Q to an honest orbital integral over P. So that takes up a, you know, like a quarter of the paper somehow. But anyways, so for all finite primes, the, get, the ratios turn out to be the um, local factors in the zeta function. And so then you start computing that the number of elements in this isogeny class is three to the g times g plus one over four times the Tamagawa number times the Sato Tate term times this limit of zeta functions, which is this. <clears throat> and I'm sure that most of you can eyeball this and see it's 0.05. And then, um, and then I got nervous, but I trolled through the beta release of LMFDB data that Christelle and co had given me. And sure there was just one thing in this isogeny class and it's automorphism group, the ring of int <laughs> is the mod 20. Questions thus far. or responses or objections or any other thing. So maybe I missed it. Did you talk about where the ordinary hypothesis was important? Uh, I didn't precisely because I had, um, I didn't tell you the story about the twisted orbital integrals. And so what happens is, so there, there's this weird hypothesis in our statement, thanks for asking Rachel, by the way, that says that we either need the isogeny class to be ordinary or we need to work over FP. And the reason is that, so in the case of FP, the twisted orbital integral is an honest orbital integral over ZP already, and I'm good. 
or I need to move life from QQ to QP to get it to, to look right, because I sort of set myself the goal of making everything kind of uniform in the primes. And I was only able to calculate um, the Satake, um, one term in the Satake transform. It seems to be under documented, or at least for kind of pedestrian minds like my own. So, but I can, if anybody is, wants to work out what happened for the other things, all you have to do is figure out um, how more of the Satake transform of the characteristic function that we're looking at behaves under base change. And so that's a, a well-defined and kind of isolatable problem in combinatorics that I'd be happy to talk about with anybody who feels like they have the chops. Thanks. Anything else? Yeah, on a related note, I'm the, um, I mean, the condition yeah. I thought that that was talking about was kind of what Stefano mentioned a few weeks ago, which is that kind of there's this uh, um, functorial equivalence that you can use in exactly this situation where uh, you're over FP or you're in the ordinary case. Yeah. Um, do you know is... if there's any relation? And like, if so, are you able to use these new results that he mentioned from the last few months to kind of go further? So um, is this isn't is this the stuff by um, Centelega and Sticks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. right. Okay, sorry. Um, so that um, in so if you use the I think that if you use the Centelega Sticks part, then um, so one thing you could do if you wanted to that would get our thing to work without any work at all is you just write down a different kind of integral at p which is happening over the Q addicts instead of over the P addicts. I, um, I spent a fair bit of time working with Centelega and or, you know, looking at their isomorphism. And I don't think there's an easy way to, so on one hand, you're right, there has to be a way to relate what we're doing to what they're doing. But I think what would be, I think the outcome of that would be you'd be doing a Kotwitz type orbital integral over Q still. So I don't think, I think that my guess is that pushes around the problem without addressing it, but I'd be, I'd be happy to be wrong here. I'm not hundred percent sure. That's like a really long way of saying, I don't know. Sorry. I was wondering, um, yeah. uh, some number of years ago, I think it may have been at an ICER meeting, actually you um, asked about, um, counts for the sizes of isogeny classes of split abelian surfaces. And I'm wondering whether you ever found an answer to that or whether that's still something you're interested in, um, you know, to get some, you know, to, to, yeah. to verify your formulas um, in a case that is maybe easier to compute. I had forgotten that I'd asked you that, thank you. Um, so I think that what our formula can deal with is the case where you're looking for, um, well, no, I guess in an individual case, if you're looking for things that are isogenous to a product of non-isogenous elliptic curves, you could hand that off to our formula and see what happens. Um, you can't do that for uh, isogenous to a square because we already uh, had our hands full dealing with commutative endomorphism ring because we needed that centralizer to be a torus. But all right, thanks. Somebody should do that, um, okay. possibly, but if there's somebody else who wants to do it, that'd be <laughs> great too. Good, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Everett. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what I'm curious is, uh, so you started the talk giving uh, these wonderful matrix uh, conjugate C class accounting formulas that uh, yep. you and I both love. Um, and then moved on to finding an alternative way to prove the theorem. Yeah. And but I know I know that you and Josh Holden uh, computed similar accounting formulas for GSP uh, GSP2G FL. And I'm wondering if you thought at all about trying to generalize this to G greater than one. Yeah. So I think so. Here's what it turns out that if you are doing. Um, say conjugate C classes in GL2 of Z mod L to the N, it's pretty benign. Like, and um, there's a formula by Nir Avni and a couple of co-authors that escaped me 
which kind of tells you exactly how to do it. Because basically the roots are the same for a while and then they're distinct. And as soon as they're distinct, they do what you expect them to do. Whereas what happens in higher symplectic groups is that there are kind of different ways that um, the roots can coalesce. Well, and so it's hard to, sorry, it's hard for me to track the combinatorics of what should happen and how to classify them correctly. And so I think that, um, I think it'd be fun to take a shot at understanding um, conjugacy classes of elements in GSP of finite rings where the um, elements themselves are not regular. There's some resonance between their roots model, but not kind of infinitely far. Um, and there are at least two ways you could do it. One is you could just sit down and try to compute it by hand. I tried and failed, but that doesn't mean that somebody else won't succeed. The other way at this point, now that all this data is in the LMFDB, you could actually um, figure out what the extra terms have to be, these kind of the, the finite terms that account for the discriminant by just, um, you could find a, a big system of equations in these things and use that to kind of learn what the right um, group theoretic calculations ought to be. So I don't know how to do that, but I think it is doable and one ought to. And certainly if you could do that, then it would help me out because then this whole thing would be kind of a lot more useful, I suspect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Worthwhile project. And um, and so if anybody either wants to take on any of this by themselves or with me or whatever, I you have my blessing and encouragement, Anthony, since I can give it support. All right. Well, great. Let's let's Jeffrey, are you finished with your talk or well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is something else, but since there aren't, um, I just want to give an advertisement of something else, but this is, uh, well, so this other stuff I've been talking about for a year or two, I know I've never spoken about this, so if anybody has a few minutes, they'd like to hear about some work I've been doing with Yano, um, it might be of use to somebody here, which would be awesome, so I want to tell a very quick story, recognizing that I'm pushing up against the limits of the time and those who have to leave can or should leave, okay? All right. So Yano, so a bunch of us have worked with prim varieties in various contexts, right? And sort of, we know that it all works over the complex numbers and over algebraically closed fields, probably of characteristics that aren't too, and I think that if I were to take a poll of like in this room right now, like our kind of confidence in statements about prims get you know, decreases as soon as the further we get away from the complex numbers. And so um, what I'd like to do is just give a very quick report on the fact that everything you thought was hope you hoped might be true is actually true. And um, this is something Yana and I are writing up Right now, sorry, that's in the context of print. I don't mean any broader claims than that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about this. So, suppose you have an inclusion of abelian schemes. And by the way, everything I'm telling you about is already new if K, if S is the spectrum of a field that isn't perfect or a field of characteristic two. So, you don't lose a lot. You have an occlusion of abelian schemes and a polarization on the target. And where this comes from is suppose you have a map of curves over S, then pull back, you can pull back pick not of here to pick not of here. Push pull says that you have an isogeny onto its image. And so the image of pick not of the Jacobian of the bottom one and Jacobian of the top is some sub abelian scheme. And that's the kind of thing that I care about. Attached to this data, there is an exponent. So I pull back the polarization of X by this inclusion. And this is a map whose kernel is kill, is a finite group scheme, is killed by some number, and that number is E. And then you can define an endomorph, a map from X to X, which projects onto Y. 
and you can let z be the image of multiplication by e minus this endomorphism. And then it turns out that z is a complement to y in the sense that x is isogenous to the product of y and z. And so this already lets you prove Poincaré reducibility over an arbitrary or fairly arbitrary scheme. And I think it wasn't until um, Brian Conrad's paper on chow traces that this was even known for imperfect fields. So it's not, as, I mean, it's not surprising that it's true, but it's hard to look up the fact that it's true. Anyway, so, A principally polarized abelian scheme is a prim Turin scheme if it shows up inside a Jacobian in such a way that when you pull back the polarization here, you get E times your favorite polarization. And it's called a prim scheme if the reason this showed up is that Z is the complement in the Jacobian of C to the Jacobian of some other curve which showed up in this way. And sort of the, the classic time that this happens, and this goes, um, so in Mumford's paper on PRIMS in the mid 60s, he, he reinvigorates this study initiated by Rudinger in 1895, where the context is you have an atoll double cover. And sort of Rudinger was doing this analytically and um, Mumford's doing this algebraically over a field of characteristic anything but two. And so what Young and I can show is that Welter's criterion from the late 80s, um, which he proved for algebraic closed fields of characteristic zero, holds over an arbitrary field. So there is a way of comparing two cycle classes, which tells you if you have a prim Turin on your hand. And I think that rather that this is unfair, I'm just going to announce that there is this criterion I'm not even going to read it to you. What I'm going to do is kind of fast forward till I get to statements that actually have some possible use to somebody in this room. So one statement is that everything is a prim Turin variety over an arbitrary field. But this is actually the more, most useful thing. So suppose you have a, a finite separable map of curves of degree D. And you let Z be the complement of this Jacobian and this Jacobian. Then Z gets some multiple of a principal polarization exactly in the following cases. There's the one that we all know about, where you have an atoll double cover, even in characteristic two. There's the one where you have a double cover, which has a ramification divisor of degree two. You can have an atoll non-cyclic triple cover, or you can have a cover of an elliptic curve. And those are all the prims. And now I'm really done. Thanks. Well, thanks, Jeff, for that wonderful talk. So we had some questions before about the first part, and if oh, there are any more, no, 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 if, if there are any questions either about the first part or the second part, this would be a great time for them now. So I just the last two slides went kind of quick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so are you saying that like any abelian variety can be expressed as like a prim for one of these? Like you said, everything yeah. is a prim, and then all prims are these. So is that what the uh, statement right. is? So everything is a prim cherry. So okay. everything shows up in a Jacobian as a in a Jacobian mm -hmm. as a complement. Mm -hmm. And I should say that um, like Bjorn Prunin's kind of wonderful Bertini theorems over finite fields, which came out at roughly the same time as Gaber's paper on albanases and space filling curves. Like those were to address the question of can a you know, does every abelian variety sit inside a Jacobian? And all we're saying is that now with a little more hmm. care, you can kind of split off, you, know, you can split it off in the way that you want to, in a way that sort of respects polarization. Asking for a, a prim is finer than a prim tier, because now you're asking that it shows up as the 
complement of another Jacobian in a particular way. And that's what's very constrained. Okay. Cool. Totally fair question given the blitz. Great, are there um, any more questions? All right, well, let's thank Jeff again. Thank you. And uh, the next talk will be March 1st by Everett Howe, and that will be the, the last talk in this series. Okay.